that for so many of us, we have a bad view of God. And when we have a bad view of God, it changes the way that we see God, ourselves, and the world around us. And so instead of walking in the deep love that God has for us, we reduce our relationship down to God, to ritual. And so we end up kind of running away from God because who wants to be in a room with that type of being that's just gonna be critical and distant? Before Christ, I was full of lust and anger and uh, just lost. Apart from Jesus, I was enslaved to fear, control, and codependency in my relationships. I was angry and bitter. I lived in fear of going to hell. I was controlled by shame. I was a slave to fear. My identity was in man. I was an ineffective husband. Because of Jesus, um, I know I am loved and valued exactly as I am. I'm redeemed. He gave me joy. I have peace with God. I now purpose to give my life away. He changed me. Christ changed me. Jesus transformed me. Welcome. My name is Derek Matthews. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, it's good to be back. I've missed y'all. Uh, I've missed this. And let's be honest, you've missed the TV, right? <laughs> so TV's back. I'm back. Uh, excited to be here this morning. Uh, before we dive in, uh, just real quick, just wanted to let you know, uh, some of you have already heard this. Uh, it's been announced in other uh, kind of arenas. Uh, but as of a few weeks ago, I actually transitioned off of full-time staff here at City Bridge. And uh, anytime there's transitions, uh, there's a lot of emotions uh, that go through that. And, and I've worked through a lot of them over the last several months. But uh, a couple of things I just want to share with you before we dive into God's word is one of the emotions I'm feeling is just is sadness. Uh, and, and that sadness is rooted in a deep love that my wife and I have for you um, and the staff team here. Uh, love makes things amazing and love makes things sad uh, when, when there's a transition that happens. Uh, I've loved this place. Uh, I've been here for eight years. I've loved the staff. I've, I've loved Kegler and his leadership. And, um, and I love y'all. Um, and so the second feeling I'm feeling, honestly, uh, mixed with sadness is excitement. It's kind of that inside out moment where, you know, both, you know, sad and joy kind of touch the ball at the same time. And it's just that weird emotion that you have to wrestle through. Um, but the excitement is just where the Lord's kind of leading us next. Uh, and we'll hear more about that at the end. Uh, but uh, just to be clear, uh, a part of what I'm doing next is not only transitioning off of staff, but I'm going to continue on with our institute program here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, which is an amazing blessing to uh, like those 10 people that are in our program have been an amazing blessing to this church body. And I'm excited to keep running with them uh, and just kind of teaching them God's word as they continue to be ministers here at City Bridge. And so I'm sad. I'm excited. Um, but more than anything, I, I'm honored. Um, I'm honored that for eight years, uh, y'all have welcomed me. Y'all have welcomed my wife. Y'all have loved me. John 13 says, the way that the world will know that you're my disciples is the way you love one another. And so thank you. It's been a joy. It's been a privilege. It's been a blessing. Thank you. Um, well, anything that you see that's good in me is only Christ in me. And I truly believe that. And so we're going to talk about him for the rest of the time. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> we were in there for a little while. Go to 1 John with me. 1 John chapter 4. Uh, we're going to be in there this morning. Uh, and it's just something that the Lord has clearly laid on my heart to share with y'all uh, this morning. And so as you kind of turn there, we're going to start our morning with a little bit of a Mad Libs game, kind of a fill in the blank game so that we can kind of get all up to speed about where we're going this morning. And so what I love about those games is like there's going to be a, a statement on the screen. It's going to be kind of a fill in the blank. And you're not allowed to think about it. You just have to kind of knee jerk first thing that comes to your mind. So not left brain logic, but like right brain instinct, like that gut answer that you have. And so I'm going to throw up a question and then we just have a conversation about what comes to your mind first. And so the first question I'm going to throw up is simply this. The worst movie I've ever seen is... <laughs> Zorro? <laughs> so Rambo. Did I hear Harry Potter? <laughs> a 
ushers, we've got some troublemakers here this morning. They need to be ushered into better taste. It's actually funny because the, the movie that first came to my mind was this one, Fantastic Beasts. Um, if you have four hours later today, I'd love to unpack why that was the first one that came to my mind. High expectations, low turnout, but that was the first one. Second one, uh, the best Mexican food in town is? Papacitas? Not Taco Bell. Well done, Sue. Did anyone say Taco Bell? Okay, thank you. We've, we've done our job. Uh, I would say Chewy's. That's because I just kind of don't get out much, uh, but that's kind of my favorite place. Uh, what about this one? The favorite thing about my community group is? Everything. Everything. That's sweet. Uh, get together more. Maybe ask this question in your group. <laughs> my favorite thing is that they spur me on to God. How cute, how lovely. All right. So this next one, uh, I'm not going to have you share out loud, but I do want you to kind of think, what is the knee jerk answer that just the first thing that comes to your mind, what is it? And so the question is this, God, help me to accept the truth about myself, no matter how it is. So don't answer it out loud, but just think about that for a moment. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Not the thing that came to your mind a couple of seconds later, but what's that first instinctual gut feeling? What comes to your mind when you think, God, help me to accept the truth about myself, no matter how blank it is. You see, I've done this in a couple of different settings and what comes up over and over and over again are words like this. Bad, ugly, messy, hard, difficult, painful, uncomfortable, embarrassing, shameful, sinful. What do you notice about all those words? They're negative. And so let that sink in for a moment, that if we believe that if we got into a room with God and we begin to say, hey, God, help me to understand certain aspects about myself, we assume certain things about ourselves and we assume certain things about God. We assume that if God got us into the room, that he would immediately say, hey, I want to tell you how bad you are, how ugly you are, how messy you are, how hard you are, how difficult you are, how painful, uncomfortable, embarrassing, shameful, sinful you are. And that tells us something deeply profound about how we view God and how we view ourselves. And let me be clear, if the first thing that came to your mind was this negative word, like it did to me when I first did this exercise, you have an unbiblical view of God. But you're not alone. You see, what's interesting is a survey was done by Bible-believing Christians. So a bunch of individuals that would believe things like, hey, do you believe that God is loving? Check. Do you believe that God is near? Check. Do you believe that God is, is present and is working your life? Check. They could get it right on a quiz. But when they were asked, hey, not only how do you intellectually understand the right answers about God, but how do you experience God, what they found was that 75% of Bible-believing Christians on an experiential level, felt like God was critical and distant. And only a small percentage, 25, said that he actually felt loving and near. And so for so many of us, God remains this like distant deity that's always a little bit upset with us, even though we know the right answers, we experience him in a false narrative of who he actually is. That for so many of us, we have a bad view of God and when we have a bad view of God, it changes the way that we see God, ourselves, and the world around us. And so instead of walking in the deep love that God has for us, we reduce our relationship down to God, to ritual. And so we end up kind of running away from God because who wants to be in a room with that type of being that's just gonna be critical and distant? Or in my you know, 15, 20 years of ministry, what I've seen so often amongst Christians is that we work really hard to do the right things and be busy for God without an actual intimate, ongoing relationship with the God who is. And so we say things like, man, if I just go to church more, if I just sin less, if I just be a certain type of person like that person or that person, then all of a sudden God will love me more, God will like me more. And so we fall into the trap of the world that says, I do, therefore I'm loved. If I just perform before God, then I'm good. If I just have my quiet time in the morning, then I'm good. Then he'll love me, then he'll like me, then he'll do the right things in my life that I want. 
We have a bad view of God. And so if you've ever found yourself saying the phrase like, look, I know God loves me. I just don't know if he likes me. Or, hey, I know God loves, like he just kind of has to, but I don't know if he actually loves me. Or I know God loves me, but all of those are indicators that we don't truly understand the love that God has for us. And so what Jesus does is he comes into the human story and he reveals the heart of God towards us, which is a heart of love. And he flips the equation that we begin to understand on a deep foundational level that I am loved fully by God because of Jesus Christ. And therefore, out of a posture of love, then we move out into the world and do for God, not to win his smile, but because we already have it. And so this morning, we're gonna be going into the love of God, swimming in what the love of God is. And in order to do that, we're gonna largely be in 1 John chapter four, and then a bit in Jude. So what I wanna do is I wanna read 1 John chapter four, verses seven through five, three. And it's a long passage, but I want you to kind of see in this passage, the heart of what John is trying to communicate. Because the way that John writes is different than other writers in your New Testament. The way that John writes is kind of just throws a bunch of stuff at you and hopes something sticks, right? And so Paul's very linear. John just kind of like, I'm just gonna say a bunch of stuff that kind of is all about the same thing. And I just want the person to really get it. John's kind of a circular writer. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna read it and you're gonna see what comes up over and over and over and over again. And so let me read to you 1 John chapter four, picking up in verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And this is the love of God made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. But this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also we are in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he's seen cannot love God who he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, who have loved God must love also his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. First John chapter four. So let me ask you, outside of like God, what was repeated over and over and over and over again? Love. 34 times in this passage do we see the word love or beloved. And this is really interesting because it comes from the apostle John, where we, when we first met John, he was <laughs> nicknamed the th- son of thunder because he wanted to kind of have Jesus in his power kind of come down on his enemies. And now something fundamentally happened in his life that he went from a son of thunder to the beloved disciple of Jesus who is calling people to walk in the full love of God as they love other people. Something fundamentally changed with him. And it's when Jesus came into his life And so what we're gonna see as we move through this passage is we're gonna see how to recognize God's love, but then also how to receive God's love. And then ultimately, how do we, on a moment by moment, day by day basis, remain in the very love of God? 
And so first up, we're gonna recognize God's love. Right here, um, we need to define a certain word. Because that word right here has been hijacked by our culture, hasn't it? Uh, you've heard it say quite often, hey, love is love, love is a feeling, love is kind of you tolerating what I'm kind of doing in my life. And all of those are, are wrong. In fact, when you de- begin to define love that way, you're actually defining what hate is. Because if I love my kids in a way that I go, you know what, just do whatever you want. Live your truth. It would not go well for them. There are three. So love is something much more deeper than love is love. Love isn't just love. You can't define a term by its own word, okay? Just, it's inconsequential. Secondly, we think, hey, love is a feeling. Love's not a feeling. Or maybe, hey, love is just tolerance for whatever you want me to do. That's not what it is. And so what is it? Well, our passage tells us explicitly what love is. It says in 1 John 4, 10, and this is love. This is how God defines us. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and did what? He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so how does God define love? It's not the way we love one another. It's not even the way that we love God, but how he loves us. And he explains his love for us that he sent his son to be the propitiation, which means wrath bearer for our sins. The beauty of our God is all those words that probably came up in most of our minds, whether it's bad, ugly, messy, hard, painful, uncomfortable, embarrassing, shameful, sinful. What God did in Jesus Christ is he took all those words and all those reasons that you feel that way at the core of yourself and he put all of that on Jesus on the cross. When he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we could experience and embrace and enjoy the very love of God that has for us. That what Jesus did on the cross was a full self-giving of himself, not even to his friends, but to his enemies. And every time you kind of look through scripture and go, hey, how do you define love? It always points to Jesus on the cross because love as radically defined in scripture is simply the sacrificial pursuit of the beloved's greatest good. That love isn't love, love isn't tolerance, love isn't a feeling that you can fall in and out of, but love is defined scripturally as a sacrificial pursuit for the beloved, the object of the person's love. It's the greatest ultimate good. And so if that's too wordy for you, uh, let me share what I share with my kids almost every day. Um, Every single day when I put my kids down or throughout the day, I'll just say, hey buddy, I love you, I love you. And my boy's three, and so a part of like the joy of being a parent is you kind of get to define reality for your kids. You get to explain what different things mean. And my, my oldest son is at that age in which he's starting to put words together to kind of like how this word, like what this word actually means. And so he'll like hold up a banana and be like, banana. I'm like, yeah, banana. But then he'll hold up like an apple and be like, banana. And I'm like, no, apple. But they're both fruit. They're in the category of fruit. And so I know that's complicated, but go with me here. Trust me. And so I'm defining terms for him. So how do you define love to a three-year-old? Well, what I do is I say, hey, I love him. And I go, hey, buddy, do you know what that means? He goes, what? And I go, love means that I will do everything in my power to make you joyful forever. That's what it means. And so then what I'll do is I'll go and I'll I'll like tickle him. And he'll laugh and I'm like, hey, this is what love feels like. It feels like a closeness. It feels like a connection. It feels like joy. But I don't just give him whatever he wants. When I discipline him, like when he tackles my other child, (laughs) what I end up doing is I put him into his little timeout space And then when I get him out, I go, hey, buddy, do you know why dad had disciplined you? He goes, what? I go, two things, buddy. One, and I'll list off whatever the offense was. And I'll try to explain to him why that's not really a loving thing. Hey, tackling your brother isn't really a loving thing. Hey, throwing a car at me isn't really a loving thing. It it hurts relationship, okay? But then I always say, hey, the main reason I disciplined you is because I love you. And I want to do everything in my power to make you joyful forever. And sometimes that's me tickling you. Sometimes that's us going out for ice cream. But other times that's me disciplining you. 
because love is the sacrificial pursuit of the beloved's greatest good and I want his greatest good. And so why would God do this? Why would he move towards the messy, ugly, hard, rebellious enemies that we are? Well, twice in the passage, we get the very heart of God, that God is love. In verse eight and 16, that God is love. That means that at the most core root nature and fundamental reality of God is a radical self-giving for the beloved's greatest good. That's the very nature and characteristic of God. And as I think about that this week and I just begin to think, okay, like God's love is like this like reflex towards us. Like the other day, my kid was like on the couch and kept scaling the ranks of the couch and kept getting higher and higher. And at a certain point I realized, hey, he's getting high enough that if he falls, he's gonna hurt himself. And I glanced over and he was kind of wobbling and I didn't sit there and go, do I help him today? Has he behaved enough today? Am I enjoying what I'm doing now more than I'm enjoying whether or not I'm gonna preserve his protection? Like, no, a jolt of energy goes through me and I move towards him, why? I don't have to think about it. I don't have to conjure up whether or not he's earned it that day, no, why? Because love is a reflex. And every one of you that has kids knows that. Like you see your kids about to do something dangerous and you don't sit there and go, I don't know, he kind of deserves it. <laughs> something happens in you before your brain can even think, you move towards them, why? Because you love them. And God's love for you moves towards you no matter what, because God at the most core nature of himself is love moving towards the beloved. And so if we have any chance of really understanding the love of God, we have to understand and recognize it when we see it. And sometimes it feels like sweet seasons of our life where the wind's at your back and everything's going your way. And sometimes it looks like everything's unraveling around you. And sometimes it looks like the sin that you've been keeping hidden just got exposed. I had a student one time years ago, he came up to me and he told me that, hey, my mom just walked in on me looking up pornography. And he was like disheveled. He was like, I don't know what to do. And I just looked at him and I just go, hey, God must really love you to expose that thing in your heart that's been keeping you from finding life and life to the fullness in him. Love is moving towards us by a loving God and there's nothing you can do to stop it. And so for some of you, the most loving thing that God's gonna be doing this morning is, he, is for you to be here and hearing a message about the love of God because you've never experienced or recognized it in the first place. You've never trusted in it. So that's why I love what verse 14 says that, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. You see, we at City Bridge, and there's thousands and millions of churches gathering across the country and the world today because we truly believe this, that we're a gathering of people, that we've seen something. We've seen the reality that Jesus Christ is who he says he was. He was really the son of God who lived a perfect life, who died for our sins, who rose from the grave, and we are putting all of our chips into him. We're putting all of our eggs into his basket. We're going all in with him we have, because we are testifying that the Father did something that God so loved the world that he sent, he moved, he initiated, that jolt of energy went through him and what he did was send his beloved into the world, his son to save the world from themselves. That's what the church is. It's a gathering of individuals that believe that. And what's so beautiful is that if you're in here and you go, man, I've never trusted in that, let me be clear. All of us were messy. All of us were hard and difficult. And it wasn't because we did enough or didn't do enough. It's because the love of God came towards us. And you can't rebel enough and you can't work hard enough to receive it. All you have to do is surrender, trust, believe, the love that God has for you. That's why the next verse says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he and God, that you're confessing and saying, God, I trust you. I've tried to look for love in all the wrong places and I see it fully in you. And so I'm gonna trust in that and accept that and live my life marked by that. He's coming after you.
He's coming after you. For some of you, the most loving thing that God is doing in your life right now is allowing a difficult season to unfold. That the passage here says that, and this is the love of God, was made manifest among us, that God sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. That as you move through this life, you're gonna have ups and downs. You're gonna have green pastures and you're gonna have dark values, but it's the Lord that moves us into them and through them, not for our temporary satisfaction, but for our eternal good. Nothing has come to you in this life that wasn't either given to you by the hands of a loving God or allowed through the hands of a loving God for your ultimate good. And at the moment in time, that can feel really hard. But God is doing something around you and he's doing something in you for your ultimate good because we're called not just to trust in a past sacrifice of Christ, but to live our lives marked by an ongoing relationship with him so that in the good times we can praise him and in the hard times we can cling to him. And God will send to you whatever you need, sunny days or storms, for you to unclench your th- grip from the things of this world so that you can cling your grip to him. Or lastly, maybe the most loving thing that God is doing in you right now is beginning to convict you of a sin that you thought you would take to the grave. You see the next verse in verse 13, it says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us. Why? Because he's given us his spirit. The spirit of God as believers in Christ lives within us. And he guides us and he directs us and he points us towards Jesus, but he also convicts us of our sin. That thing that's holding us back from experience, the fullness of life that Jesus came to offer. And so all of these things and more are a thousands difference of ways that God is pursuing us, sacrificing himself for your ultimate good because he's love and he loves you. So the late Tim Keller said this about love. He said to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial, go on social media, a lot of people, a lot of likes, but not a knowing of the person. So it's comforting, but it's superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear, isn't it? To kind of pour ourselves out to someone and for them to kind of reject us in that. But to be fully known and truly loved is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from our pretense. It humbles us out of our self-righteousness and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. And that is the love of God for you, that you are fully known by God. Even the things that you're like, I don't even know that about myself. He knows that about you. And yet simultaneously, he fully loves you. That the gospel, again, that Tim Keller says, is that we are more messed up than we could possibly imagine and yet more love than we could dare hope for at the same exact time. That's the love of God for us. We need to recognize it, but we also need to receive it. And that's where the passage goes next, that we recognize God's love, but we also need to receive God's love. You see, there's this verse in here that's really important in verse 16. It says that we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. And I want you to notice these two words specifically, to know and to believe. Because some of you right now are going, hey, everything you said, I know. I know God loves me. I know God cares for me. But you might still fall into that 75% of Christians that go, hey, I know it on an intellectual level, but I don't experience it. And so that idea of to know is an intellectual understanding that yes, God is love. Yes, God does care for me. Yes, I read it in the scripture. This I know for the Bible tells me so. I got it. I can get it right on a quiz. But the passage doesn't just say, hey, you've come to know the love of God, but you actually believe it. On an emotional, experiential, moment by moment level that you truly experience the love that God has for you. So again, have you ever said the phrase, hey, I know God loves me, but if there's anything after that sentence, it's just an indicator that you might have the right data points about God, but you don't truly believe on a core level in experiencing the life that he has for you, walking in that love. Because in every relationship, it's not enough to know certain things about the person. You have to experience them as a person. 
You have to actually have the experience. And so husbands, you can say all day long to your wife, I love you, I love you. But she needs to experience that love. She needs to go out on a date, have flowers, candles, the whole nine yards, everything, right? (laughs) Amen, amen. Let's hold off the nudging right now. Um, But isn't it true? of every relationship. It's not enough to know, you have to actually have an experience because God is an actual person. And so how do we know, how do we know if we're truly walking in the love of God? Well, the passage gives us three indications of how we know that not only we know, but we believe the love that God has for us. The first indication is that we're fearless, we're fearless. There's no fear in love, verse 18, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. When you're truly walking in the love of God, your life is marked by a fearlessness, both before God and for others. You don't fret. You don't get anxious. The Christian is meant to have a wonderful, courageous confidence about themselves. Why? Because they're not looking for love in every single small dosage that they can manage, but rather they have experienced it fully in God. And when they experience it fully in God, they're actually free to go and love other people. And so we're meant to have a fearlessness because he loves me. And so I don't need the approval or validation of others. I don't need to go to my crutches throughout the day. I don't need to binge watch the next show just to kind of drown out my fears. I don't need to control others or a situation. I don't need to care how many likes I have, how many followers I have. I don't need to search for something that makes me feel okay because I've already found it because he found me. You're meant to be fearless. But from that fearlessness, you're also meant to have a freedom to love others. First John 4, 19, which is my family's kind of life verse, is that we love because God first loved us. You see this idea of freedom to love others in a lot of places in the passage, verse seven, eight, 11, 12, 20, 21, you get the picture. But here's the simplest way that we love because God has first loved us. That one of the main indicators in your life of whether or not you're truly believing and walking in the love of God is you have a full freedom to love those around you. And so Jonathan Edwards, uh, one of my favorite theologians used to say that the, the great sin of mankind is that the love that was meant to radiate out from us has curled in upon us. We're just loving ourselves, self-focused, self-centered. And what love does is it bursts outward towards other people. And so let me ask you a couple of questions. When you walk into a room, do you think of your, to yourself, hey, can I hear I am? Talk to me, be interested in me. What can this person do for me? Or do you kind of think, hey, there you are. Let me, let me move towards you, let me talk with you. Let me engage with you, what can I do for you? Or how about this, when you get some extra income coming your way, is your first thought, hey, what can I spend this on? How can I spend this? Or is it, how can I give this? Who are people in my life that I know needs this? Because it's come to me and I wanna be a conduit to give it out. Or how about this, and this one's mine. When you're focused in on something and you get interrupted, whether you're focused in on something important or your phone, um, do you welcome the interruption or do you get annoyed with the person who interrupted you? I don't know about you parents, but my kids are my love barometer. If I have a long day and I've kind of been walking in my own strength and I come home then all I wanna do is have a little bit of me time, right? Me time, it's my time, it's my time, stop it, it's my time. Like, like, and so what I do is I just go, out and go into a corner, pull out my phone and I just pray to the good Lord that my kids like don't like do anything, just, just stop, just, every, just noise down and just don't fight each other because I want my me time. And then they come up and they interrupt and I get annoyed. But the days that I'm really walking the love of God, then when I get home, Man, all I wanna do is to radiate that love back to them. And so we go and we hang out, I get on the floor, we tickle each other, we we have dance parties because someone's gotta show my boys how to dance and it's not gonna be TikTok, right? (laughs) Tell me, dad, because someone's gotta show them how to move, right? And they're gonna inherit my weird dancing because that's love. 
parents. <laughs> love embraced becomes love extended. When you truly embrace the love of God, it naturally flows out. Scripture presents the love of God like this waterfall coming down from heaven. And we're not supposed to just hold a bucket and go, okay, I'm good. We're supposed to be funnels that take it in and then push it out to the world. And so if you're struggling with loving those around you, whether your family or your enemy, stop trying to do it on your own terms and in your own strength. Sit with the very love of God. And from that love of God, you'll have a freedom to love others. The last indicator is that we have a faithfulness to God. Chapter five, verse three says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. A lot of my legalistic friends will see this passage and go, see, okay, I gotta work my way to God. I gotta keep his commandments so that God would love me. No, this is an indicator that you're already walking in the love of God. That as you receive the love of God to you, your natural response is to respond in a faithfulness to God. I had a friend of mine text me this question the other day that I thought was so helpful for this moment. It said, do you feel most loved by God when God is making much of you or when he's freed you to make much of him? Because God is after his own glory, even in his pursuit of us and his love. And what's beautiful is Jesus will whittle down all the commandments to two things. Love God, love people. Those are the indicators of how you know you're walking in the love of God. So how you doing? How you doing? Are you fearless? Are you free? Are you faithful? Because that's the fruit that comes out of a deep abiding relationship with God. And at this point, you're probably asking, hey, if that's the output, then, then what's the input? If that's the fruit, then how do I cultivate this in my life? Well, that's where we're gonna go next as we understand how do we remain in the love of God. And to that, we're gonna go to the book of Jude. It's the last book before you get to Revelation. And what Jude would say is, but you, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. There's one single command in this, and it's beloved, keep yourselves in the love of God. Beloved, you're loved. You're the object of God's love. And so the most natural response is to keep, to remain, to abide in that love. It's like for you parents, sometimes the best thing you want for your kids is just to physically stay in one spot, right? Just stay, just stay, just don't move, just stay. And what God wants for us is to stay, remain, keep, abide, remain in his love. And that doesn't indicate that you can lose it, but rather we just kind of move on from it and we kind of live our life as if God doesn't love us on a moment by moment, day by day basis. And God is saying, no, 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 remain in that, abide in that, stay in that, stay in that experience, waterfall coming down from heaven to you so that you can flow it out to others. And he's gonna give us three ways to do that. First is an inward reality, that we would build ourselves up in the most holy faith. That's inward. And that means that we would cultivate a deep intimacy with Jesus, a deep dependency on Jesus. One of my favorite practices right now is just to wake up, I did it this morning, wake up and kind of leave the house and walk through my neighborhood and before it's a thousand degrees outside and I can actually walk outside without melting, I just go and I just kind of air out everything before God. Try to get everything of me out so that all that's really left is Christ in me. And then I think about verses and I meditate upon them. And what I'm trying to do is build up the most holy faith that God has given me. Continue to cultivate that and work on that. And that's one of thousands of different ways you can do this. That's actually why we have things like men's and women's Bible study. Those aren't things that you just go and check off a box, but they're there to design to help you posture yourself before the Lord, to receive his love. It's why we have community. It's why we ask people to serve. Because in community, you're around people and you have to get out of yourself for a moment and actually care about other people. And serving's the same way. You have to get out of yourself to actually go and love people. And so if you're looking for ways to kind of stir up that in you, Man, there's a thousand opportunities here, but whatever it is, posture yourself to build up yourself in the most holy faith as you walk deeply with God. 
from inward we have upward, that we would pray in the Holy Spirit. That means that we would pray in line with God's word and way in a connection with God through the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. So that we would study his word, talk to him, have honest conversations about where we're at, how we view him, how we view ourselves, what we're struggling with and moving through this life that we would pray in the Holy Spirit, that we wouldn't just look inward and work on us, but we would look upward and look at him. And then finally, it would be forward, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, that the focus of the believer is to focus forward at Jesus that love has come, but love will return. And our life is anchored in that love. And a friend of mine told me this that was super helpful in this season of just like, hey, when you look ahead 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, when you forward face and look at the return of Christ, how do you wanna have lived this season? So many of us get so focused in on the here and now and God is going, hey, I want to work in you, but I want you to look up and I want you to look forward at my coming son because he's coming back. And we're entering a world where there is no sin, there is no pain, there is no lust, there is no anger, there is no more crazy seasons, there's no more insecurities, no more pride, but the full embrace of God's love forever. That's where we're going. And we're meant to link our lives to that. And so let me come back to this question that we asked at the beginning. God, help me to accept the truth about myself no matter how it is. You see, if we truly believe the love that God has for us, then we would begin to see that what God would do if he was in a room with us is say how wonderful it is. Because at the root heart of God towards you is love. God is love. And he's coming after you. I've been at City Bridge for eight years. And every time I peel away and just ask, hey God, what do you want me to share to this church body? Every single time, it's the same thing. Same three words. Tell them I love them. It's because of that. It's because I've experienced that. And the highs and lows of my life and I've experienced some of the highest of highs and lowest of lows over these last eight years. And every single time, God met me with his love. And if you don't have that experience with God, what the scripture calls us to do is to look no further than Jesus on the cross because God demonstrates his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the demonstration of God's love for you. So come into encounter the very love of God Embrace it, experience it, enjoy it, walk in it, remain in it. Because City Bridge, he loves you. He loves you.